It's Tuesday, November 7th. I'm Matt Harmon. Welcome to the Yahoo Fantasy Football Show. It is a hell of a day to talk ball. And joining me to do just that is the one and only, the man himself, Andy Barons. Andy, what's going on, buddy? It is a hell of a day to talk ball. Um, actually, I was I attended a football game this weekend, which does not happen actually very often in season, right? But I hit that hit that barn burner of a of a ten seven game between Iowa and Northwestern at Wrigley Field. Many are calling it the college football game of the year. It was amazing. Um, yeah, uh, so good times. Yeah, you were. Um, I'm not going to say you know you were in a state. Uh, Sunday morning. I mean, I've I've definitely shown up on on Sunday. Not not this year. Maybe in my younger days, shown up in a worse state on Sunday morning. I'm not going to say that you were in a state Sunday morning, but it was clear from the slight. I'm going to call it slight gravel in your voice that you had had a good time the night before. I was panicked that I wasn't going to have a voice because I did not have a voice at the end of Saturday night. And like I was I we, like I made my wife leave the bar because I was like, oh, my God, my voice is nearly gone. It, it's Dan's going to be Dan Harris is going to be so mad tomorrow morning if, <laughs> if, I, if I can't speak because that's where we were. Like I was I was completely hoarse. And I, you know, it's one of those days where like you're yelling at the game. Somehow I found three hours of things to yell about at, uh, in a game with 17 points. And then you're yelling at a bar. And man, I was I was cooked. But I did. I did rebound, so I was excited about that. Yeah. Um, I don't, it, it, what what must my life be like? Uh, like I root for Iowa football on Saturdays and Bears football on Sundays, and <laughs> it's just not a. It's not. It's not the right place to be. It's not the right place to be in your football life. Yeah. What? <laughs> who? Who did you piss off in a former life? To <laughs> like, you got to roll right into a seventeen point affair, and to like, well, we'll see if Tyler Bajan can outduel Derek yep. Carr today. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. That's been that's been my existence for the last for the last few years. But it does make, you know, uh, sometimes a Sunday will hit and people are complaining about like the quality of the games that day. And my experience is the day before, you know, I've watched I've watched I've watched Iowa gain like 105 yards of offense and score eight points or something like that and win eight to six. And I'm like, wow, this is great. This is a you're kidding me. A 24 to 17 game. That's crazy. Well, the people who complain about the quality of football irritate me for so many reasons, Andy. <laughs> one, because it's like, yeah, okay, it's not Iowa football, number one. Number two, it's <laughs> usually just people that are pissed about fantasy football and they don't want to admit it. They want to be like, no, 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 no. Yeah. Actually, this is bad ball. It's usually just like the defense is actually taking it to the offense and like multiple multiple sides of the ball get, 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 get played here. They get paid to play. Uh, and, and also, obviously, there's the common retort, which is talk to me in June when you're watching, you know, curling or whatever the <laughs> hell people do in the offseason, water polo, and, and, and you'll be wishing for this football. And normally it's just like, shut up. Nobody wants to hear you complain. So a lot of a lot of things to play there. But Andy, I would say that because of your <laughs> immense resume and qualifications, Dealing with bad football and dealing with complaints about bad football it makes you a perfect candidate for the co-host of this episode. <laughs> it really uh, which does. Is, which, is why, <laughs> which is why you join me every Tuesday to go through the People's Panic Meter. And with that, let's get into the post-week nine People's Panic Meter. As you all know, the show is all about you, the people. So every week, we reach out to you to see what has you panicked heading into a Monday morning about your fantasy team after all the action on Sunday. Best responses get in to the show, of course. By now, you probably know this, but for the new folks, maybe. A couple of ways to get submitted. Uh, the mailbag, fantasy mailbag at yahoosports.com. We take videos. We take written messages. I also post on X uh, You know, every single night after the Sunday Night Football game to solicit responses. So let's get into these responses. But before we do that, Andy, we do have to talk the coping corner. Uh, this is where Andy and I both introduce a candidate to the coping corner. It's basically like we're beyond panic. You need to just settle and and live your live your life with the reality that this was this was a mistake. It just kind of is what it is at this point. Um, that's the coping corner. That's what it's built for. We have so far put three players into the coping corner: Ramondre Stevenson, Christian Watson, Damian Pierce. Reminder that if you're in the coping corner, we don't talk about you on this episode anymore, okay? Because unless we need to do a mea culpa, maybe down the line, but yeah. for the most part, we don't talk about you in this episode anymore because you're just coping. You're no longer panicking. So, Andy, who is your submission this week to the coping corner? 
I think uh, I think I might be overreaching here, but I'm going to try it anyway. Um, and I'm I'm just going to say all of Arthur Smith's players, uh, all of them. We've we've talked so far on this show. We've we've had to do segments. Uh, had to do. It's been our pleasure to do segments on Drake London, <laughs> Kyle Pitts, Bijan Robinson. Uh, we've hit them all at various points. Like, here's the thing. I feel like I feel like Arthur Smith just wants to be the star of Arthur Smith's offense. Uh, I kind of feel like that's where we're at. And if you'd give him like 2003 Randy Moss, that guy would get five or six targets a game. And if you gave him like 1997 Barry Sanders, that guy would get 15 or 16 touches a week and they would pull him at the goal line. Um Atlanta has made some of the some of the stranger sort of goal to go calls in the league so far this season. I feel like I feel like Smith himself just can't get through like a, a, a Q and A with any member of the press or with uh, collected members of the press without seeming uh, like super fragile and defensive and aggrieved. I think we just have to accept that he is not going to make the personal usage decisions that uh, that y- y- seem optimal to the rest of us. Um, like we can keep talking about Kyle Pitts, we can keep talking about Bijan Robinson, but I don't I don't see this changing dramatically. I don't see this getting better. Um, it would probably take multiple injuries for either of these players to really get force fed. So I don't. This this is one of those things where I don't I don't feel like I'm going to have new things to say. And I feel like you can see this coming now. I had a different candidate to put in the coping corner, but um, I actually agree with your submission so hard. I'm not even going to talk about that particular player. (laughs) It was also much more boring than yours. So we'll probably save it for next week when this player inevitably does nothing once again. Um, (laughs) So I'm with you. Let's put Falcons players into the coping corner, but let's have a quick, you know, moratorium on uh, the Falcons and and why they're going in here. We got a submission here from from Colin M. Actually, about Bijan Robinson, basically saying I was able to trade for Bijan after Headache Gate, and that has been a letdown so far. <laughs> Are you concerned that soon we'll be talking about Bijan the way we have been talking about Pollard the last few weeks? Well, um, jokes on you, Colin. We're actually putting <laughs> B. John Robinson and all the Falcons into the coping corner without even talking about Tony Pollard as a candidate for the coping corner. And you're so right, Andy, to bring up the short yardage stuff. Uh, Rich Rebar, oh. one of the one of the greatest. You know, Rich Rebar yeah. talked in quote tweeting a Matt Waldman, another great analyst, quote tweeting a Matt Waldman clip of the like little rushing play they did to Johnu Smith uh, <laughs> on the goal line. It was basically then said uh, the Falcons have now converted 59.9, 9 of 17, 59.9% of their goal to go possessions for touchdowns. That's 30th in the league. This is how Greg Allman, who covers the NFC South, actually also shared that Matt Waldman clip and, and shared this. The Falcons have run 18 offensive plays inside the opponent's five-yard line this season. Bijan Robinson has one touch for no gain. <laughs> Other usage, (laughs) Tyler Algier, nine carries, nine yards, three touchdowns. Desmond Ritter, two carries, one touchdown. Drake London, one touchdown, two targets. Jonu Smith, one touchdown on four targets, slash carries. I can't believe I have to say slash carries with Jonu Smith, the backup tight end. Kyle Pitts, Michael Pruitt, uh, Kaderil Hodge, no catches on one (laughs) target for each of those guys. I mean, that is a wild list to read off when – you know, the, you should have some real monsters here in the red zone. Like, and Andy, I have, I've said, I don't want to be associated with like Matt Harmon is an Arthur Smith guy. I'm, I'm not like, I'm not, I don't love the way Arthur Smith comports himself. I don't love the way he handles himself. I probably don't. I mean, I don't know the guy, but I probably don't want to get a beer with Arthur Smith. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I have been a fan of how he designs and calls offense i think he's a really really good offensive coach dating back to his days in tennessee however this is why the job is of evaluating head coaches is so hard andy right because you can be a great offensive coordinator you can be great at the thing that gets you into a head coaching job but still somehow get screwed by your own tendencies in being really good at the job that you had because here's the deal andy if 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 in tennessee when arthur smith is the offensive coordinator and Arthur Smith's like, you know what I want to do? I want to take Derrick Henry out of this goal line package, and I want to put in insert backup running back here. Mike Vrabel's going to look at him and be like, 
no, we're not freaking doing that. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, instead of instead of an AJ Brown target here, how about we, you know, throw it to the fourth string receiver more times uh, than not? The head coach is going to say, yeah, not we're we're going to go ahead and not do that. Um, we're going to even in the install meeting leading up to the week, it's like this is really good, Arthur, but we're probably not going to have. <laughs> <laughs> Derrick Henry not be our goal line back, okay? Um, so for all those reasons, now that Arthur Smith just has the autonomy to do that, he's no longer even good at the thing that he was good at to get the job of being a head coach. The The irony is that there was a time, it feels like a million years ago, but there was a time when we were like, oh man, who's going to unlock Jonu Smith um, years ago? And like, it's finally happened. Um, and it's happened b- because of Arthur Smith in this, in this super weird offense where the, the actual best player for, for any specific situation is often not on the field. Um, it is, it is wild. Um, I don't, I don't get the Bijan Robinson thing and I, you know, I, Maybe I, I should have seen it coming, but like, I, again, you take a, I hate to lean into like dr- draft capital arguments, but man, you take a running back there, you take right. that running back specifically right there. You, you have to, you have to build some stuff around him. Like you have to, you have to give him opportunities when you are in sight of the goal line. Like that is just wild that it's not happening. It has happened for the entirety of the history of, of the NFL. It is not happening in Atlanta right now. It is wild. Um, I can't I can't explain it except um, to fully agree with you that somebody needs to provide guardrails around uh, <laughs> Arthur Smith's because co- his because his worst instincts are are often taking over and I, like I kind of agree with you some of the some of the stuff can be fun um, I don't know a tight end throwing it to another tight end is kind of fun conceptually but it is not fun when you know um, that is happening at, at the expense of touches for like a uniquely talented player right it's not fun when it happens all the time all the time yeah all the time when we're in week 10 and we're still talking about it you know like perfect example the detroit lions right remember four weeks ago when everybody was complaining about jameer gibbs like why'd they even draft jameer gibbs if he's just a change of pace back well he is like probably one of if not the reason that they win on Monday night against the Las Vegas Raiders who employed an energy vampire at head coach and were a joke at the time. I get that. <laughs> I understand that, but still he's like the reason they win that game. Right. And and he's been a truly developing player. Like the, the, the progression has been a clear upward trajectory for Jameer Gibbs. And like when you're the Detroit lions and you're a good team and you're winning games, you can say, uh, shut up, nerds. Like, we'll figure it out with Jameer Gibbs in a bit. But yeah. until then, we're going to give Dave Montgomery a boatload of carries and we're going to win football games doing that. And then we're going to win football games when we're doing that. But then when you're Arthur Smith, who at times I have said, yo, you guys, you fantasy dorks, you can't complain about what Arthur Smith is doing because they're winning games. Like, it just, sorry, but when the plan's successful and, and it results in the one thing that really truly does matter, which is wins, you can't complain about it. But when you're four and five and you're losing to Josh Dobbs, you know, who basically is like the antithesis of everything that <laughs> Arthur Smith believes, which is like, no, I actually only am the only one that understands this. And you peons don't really get what's going on here. Kurt yeah. Warner, Hall of Fame quarterback. I'm sure he makes a lot of money. Maybe he can solve the other world's problems. What a thin skin thing to say. I mean, just absolutely wild to, to like Kurt Warner. What an offensive guy. Kurt Warner. Give me a break. Like, yeah. what are we talking about here? football is so complex. If you're not in the building, you really just don't get it. It's like, well, Josh Dobbs is in the building for 36 hours or whatever. And he comes <laughs> and he beats your team. Like, yeah, when that's happening, we can now all say like what you're doing with the, the player that you took eighth overall, like at a premium position. And then literally the moment after you draft him, you're like, yeah, but Tyler Algiers, are re- cause you, you can go back and look up coach speak index. Great account on X. Uh, they're doing a great job. They're like all over Arthur Smith, of course, naturally. So, they shared the, the the clip this morning of like literally right after Bijan Robinson got drafted, and he Arthur Smith gushed about Bijan Robinson, but also said like Tyler Algier, man, what a good player, yada yada yada. He's still going to bring this like thunder element to the lightning, and and you know all the typical coach speak stuff. Like somebody's got to sit there and say like, yeah, Arthur, actually, we took this guy because he's a transformative talent. Like we need to use him like that. So we can when when they're starting to lose games to Josh freaking Dobbs, who had been in the, the doesn't even know the play calls. Had to have Jordan Addison tell him, like, actually, on this yeah. side of the field, this is the route that we're going to be running. <laughs> now we're allowed to say, like, this is ridiculous, and it's jumped the shark. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. The the 
the, it's really, I don't know. I don't know how much longer this particular coaching career, head coaching career is going to last, but like he needs to, he needs to handle himself differently at a podium yes. too. Um, that like, that's gotten kind of outrageous. Like, and as you were, as you were talking about Dane Campbell and you're talking about the lion situation, like, man, like Campbell knows when to spread, like, Campbell doesn't care if um, if people are are a little bit critical about the usage of this player or that player, and Campbell is able to shrug off a, a question about any individual player's specific usage. And he gave us some some total cliched coach speak about uh, uh, Jameer Gibbs and how they had big plans for him earlier in the season. Oh yeah, big plans. Love the guy. Got to get him more involved. Like just give us that. Like that's right. what. That's what people do. Um, you, you don't even have to go like full Belichick and just, you know, onto Cincinnati, everything. But like, you got to you got to have thicker skin than he has. Like, not every question is is somebody trying to interrogate you or accuse you of, of you know, coaching negligence or anything like that. He takes so many things so personally. Yeah. He's so prickly. Um, and, and you not in know a why, Andy, because I think probably in his heart of hearts, he's like, maybe I shouldn't be doing maybe maybe what I'm doing is a little ridiculous, right? Like yeah. maybe maybe I am overcomplicating a sport that is complicated, but is often overcomplicated by by gatekeepers like Arthur Smith, right? So maybe maybe that's why he's so like bristled about, whoa, you, what are you trying to accuse me of? Yeah, no, nobody who's like legitimately confident um, and, and and feels like they're they're actual reasons that are underlying everything they do. Nobody like that responds in the way that Arthur Smith does. It's it's wild. Look, I'm just glad we're putting them in the coping corner so we don't have to talk about the freaking Falcons <laughs> anymore because I'm tired of yes. talking about them. I'm tired of thinking about them. And yeah, we'll see what happens with Arthur Smith, who, you know, this team is built in in his image by by all intents and purposes. So um, I don't know. He's in an utterly winnable division. And I do think yep. like, you lose a game like that on Sunday, your seat, I'm not saying it's like a hot seat, but it does get a little warmer and we'll see we'll see how the man does under more pressure. So, I'm glad that all Falcons have been added to the coping <laughs> corner so we simply do not have to talk about them in the panic meter episode cuz I don't really know what else to say at this point. And and I'm not I'm not every other fantasy analyst and Andy's not either like that just let's trash Arthur Smith um, you know, the, to 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 get clicks and retweets and and because it's an it's an easy layup like these are real legitimate criticisms we have about the operation and and I've been a defender of his offense before but I can't defend what's going on at this point so what a beautiful addition to the coping corner on that note let's get into the week nine submissions we did have that one from Colin M shout out uh, to Colin M on that one however he mentioned Tony Pollard yeah we got a lot of Tony Pollard once again Stephen B sends in me again 16 team standard league and luckily Rashad White is carrying me to a four and five record nah, that's not something I ever thought I'd need <laughs> with that being said how much longer can I wait for Tony Pollard I understand that the Eagles are a tough matchup but the way Cowboys the Cowboys use Tony Pollard is asinine and I am a lifelong Cowboys fan if I were to sucker someone in a trade based on his name value and hope they don't open up his game long who would you target um uh, Steven, I tell you what, you're probably not going to be able to do that because I don't think Tony Pollard has the name value that you think he does, number one, even though yeah. he was a high round draft pick. And number two, Andy, I want you to heat check me on this. I said on the show last night that I think Tony Pollard is screwed because, and like, mm, screwed. He's in is what it is territory because the offense is actually good with how they have been using him the last two games. Do you uh, agree or disagree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been, you know, result aside from from week nine, this has been a kind of nice stretch for them. Two weeks ago was was great. I mean, it was unfortunate for Pollard. That was the exact sort of game script that you would have expected Pollard to go off in. Didn't happen. But the the leaning into C.D. Lamb and his talents, um, you know, throwing when they get inside of the end zone, uh, re- like I don't know, it's been it's been reasonably effective. They maybe found a little something with Jalen Tolbert. I don't I don't think the I don't think the offense isn't looking great. I will also say, uh, with with respect to Pollard, um, the the if you want to compose a buy low argument for Pollard, the essence of it had nothing to do with the Philadelphia game. That was always going to be like kind of a thorny right. matchup. And he was fine, right? He was fine, like 12 carries, 50 plus yards. That's that's fine. I don't know I don't know what you thought was coming from Pollard in that one. But like one key thing from that game is he's he still played 77% of the snaps. Like he doesn't come off the field. That's good. Um, but the essence of the buy low argument was the stretch of games that is coming up right now. 
It's the Giants, it's the Panthers, it's Washington, it's Seattle. We saw what, uh, you know, the Ravens ground game just did to the Seahawks. Like, this is a very beatable stretch. And if there are going to be big Tony Pollard games, um, th- this is when it happens. So, I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, like, sell low on Tony Pollard. I think you're right. Like, everybody is aware that this season has not gone according to the best case scenario for Pollard. So, I don't, I don't think... I don't think there's a lot of excitement out there, but I, but I can actually compose a matchup-based uh, buy-low argument for Pollard. It begins this week, not this past week, um, and I and I do kind of like the fact that he barely ever, he hardly ever comes off the field. It's not like, it's not like we've seen like Dowdle step in and take all of last year's Zeke Elliott carries or anything like that. They're still kind of leaning into into Pollard as their primary runner. You and I have talked before about how the the nature of the runs are not exactly what they were last year. Um, and, and perhaps that's not working in Pollard's favor, but man, he's got a, I'm gonna, not going to call it a layup line cause it's the NFL and every team's trying and these are pros. Um, but this is, this is about as good a stretch as it can get. So I don't think I would sell now ahead of it. And I don't think I'd be like, well, I've got Rashad white. I'm covered there. I've, <laughs> I've, I've solved my running back problem because I've got Rashad white. I can throw Pollard on the block. I actually think, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little tempted to buy in some leagues because I see all these responses coming back in the, in the panic meter. And I'm like, man, I wonder if there's a giveaway here. Yeah, I just think he's probably not going to meet expectations from like big high preseason expectations when a lot of fantasy analysts were like, he should be a first round fantasy pick. He's not going to be a first round fantasy pick and he's probably not even going to be like worth a second round fantasy pick in hindsight. But yeah, you're right that like Brees Hall got locked up against uh, the the Philadelphia Eagles and Brees Hall is an infinitely better player than Tony Pollard is like no question about it. In any scenario, uh, I do think that, like, again, the way the Cowboys are playing offense right now is kind of conducive to a space back like Pollard being a guy that gets maybe max 17, 18 touches on a given week. Um, I think they could get him more involved in the passing game and they probably will get him more involved in the passing game at some point. Just like I think if you said uh, my 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 thought is if you sent out a trade offer of Tony Pollard right now, like trying to give him away, like on the name value. Like if somebody did that to me, I would say like, well, you're the dumbass that took Tony Pollard when he was <laughs> never he he could never beat out Zeke Elliott, right? Like, <laughs> and and I, I'm saying that yeah. is like I'm the dumbass because I took Tony Pollard in a couple drafts, so I'm not calling anybody. It's certainly not the great Stephen B. I'm not calling you a dumbass. Nobody listening to this podcast is a dumbass. I, the guy hosting the podcast is the dumbass. So <laughs> I should have seen this coming more more so. But yeah, Andy's right that like Giants, Panthers, Washington. I'll tell you what. We are, I'm allowing some panic on Tony Pollard. Uh, I think if he comes back with another like 12 for 50 line against the Giants, I yeah. think we don't even debate coping corner. I think we just, we just, uh, you know, they put, just wave him we, through. Absolutely. Yeah. Wave yeah. him through fast pass, fast pass for Tony Pollard <laughs> into the coping corner next week. And I think that's just kind of where we have to stand right now, because I think that is, is what it is territory with Tony Pollard at this point. Yeah. The other thing is you're not going to like, you're going to get a, my problem for your problem kind of trade. Like you're right. not going to get nobody, nobody's giving you, you're not getting Steph Diggs for Tony Pollard. <laughs> like that's not out there for you. I don't, I don't even know who to like, you're not going to, I, I, no I, I don't, I don't know who it's going to be. It's going to be like, um, Garrett, I don't know. Can you get Garrett Wilson right now for Tony Pollard? Do you want that? Like, I, I think you mm-hmm. gotta, I, I think you gotta see if you get a big game at any point in these next couple of weeks, and then maybe you can revisit this topic. But he's, he's also, by the way, he's on pace for like fourteen hundred scrimmage yards and and sixty plus catches. So like, this is also one of those seasons that um is going to look like next year when we're prepping for drafts. As long as Tony Pollard doesn't get hurt rest of season and he just kind of finishes it out the way he's going, we're gonna look back on this thing and be like, huh, that's a. That's actually kind of a lot of yards. And he finished as whatever. He finishes like the RB 13, 14, which is not particularly helpful. And people who had him on a roster will know that throughout the season, it he was wasn't not. necessarily winning <laughs> it for you. But he but he was piling up like 70 yard weeks. And at the end of the at the end of the season, that that looks like something. Right. And at this time, he has two count them, one, two touchdowns, and they both came in week one. I bet you he finishes with six. Right. Yeah. Like the yeah. rest of the season, I bet you he finishes with six. So then, yeah, in that scenario, we're looking back 1400 scrimmage yards, 60 catches, six touchdowns. Like I get somebody will hype up Tony Pollard next year. Yeah. It just probably won't be me. <laughs> All right. With that, let's move on to Anthony P who sends in Cooper Cup. He needs Matt Stafford. So I'm panicked about that. Also, Puka Nakua. 
see the same reason for Cooper Cup. Uh, we actually had a pretty decent amount of panic about Cooper Cup because it wasn't as if he like it'd be one thing if it's like, OK, Cooper Cup was coming off a couple of monster games and then he got blanked in the bread ripping game. Yeah, well, that's pretty easy to see coming. But Cooper Cup is also coming off four catches, 21 yards against the Cowboys, two catches, 29 yards against the Pittsburgh Steelers the week before that. And then obviously, again, just two catches for 48 yards from uh, Brett Rippon. So I, I'm I'm a little panicked about the Rams, uh, to use a Scott Pianowski term, that they could have lookout below potential. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's fair. And so much of this comes down. Like, you, it's okay to be like, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not that happy that Cooper Cup did not deliver against the Steelers. That was a beatable matchup. Um, I'm never I'm never totally surprised when somebody doesn't blow up against uh, against the Cowboys. So whatever. But the Stafford thing is is the essential issue. I guess it was promising that they held out hope for him all of last week. But also it always seemed like Brett Rippon was going to get that start. So um, like the healing that takes place for Stafford during this bye week is huge. And it's kind of I don't know. It's kind of nice that you don't have to wrestle with this. Do I start Puka? Do I start Cooper thing this week? Um, Because I know how painful it was. It was I found it almost impossible to rank them. Like, what? I don't know. What do you do? I think they're great. Like at some at some level, you just had to, like, keep asking yourself, could I really could I really sit Cooper Cup for like, you know, whatever, George Pickens and you find a name and you're like, no, I can't do it. They they were excruciating to rank. So uh, I but this is all this is all about Stafford, because if we can get back to like early season Stafford and the ball is just humming and he like he can make any throw. I feel great about him again. Um, but this is, this is, this is way out of our hands, right? Like we, you know, all, all you can do is keep a good thought for the, the, the thumb, uh, uh, on the right hand of Matt Stafford. Yeah. It's pretty tough when like the best thing we can tell you is light a prayer candle, but I kind of yeah. like, <laughs> that's, like, that's, all that's I it. That's it. Um, cause yeah, normally it's like a, a receiver has two, four catches for 21 yards or two for 29. Like I said, those games before, um, the Stafford situation, I'd be like, yeah, I mean, he's probably going to be fine. Cooper cup, but, um, I don't feel that way right now. I don't feel that way right now because yeah. of where Matthew Stafford is. And, and I just really wonder with this Rams team, like there were times during the year where I know I'm sure we said on this podcast, it's like Matthew Stafford is playing really, really good football, but it never fully translated to, to the stat sheet, to the production. And like now, unfortunately, I just feel like it's not ever going to happen now because Stafford, like, we're dealing with injuries and now I feel like we're going to be at the Rams are three and six. We're going to be asking a lot of the same questions about the LA Rams that we probably thought we were going to be asking, um, despite like a really good start and like Puka's emergence and all that stuff. Yeah, it would be a really, you know, I, we're, we're speaking here on Monday afternoon. It would be a, it would be a pretty bad sign if I can't, I don't even know who the free agent quarterbacks are right now. Like Colt McCoy, like, I don't know who's the, who's the best option. If they start kicking the tires on, on oh, free yeah. agent quarterbacks, I'm really going to panic though. Yep, I don't really love the idea of Colt McCoy uh, throwing to Puka Nakua. <laughs> don't love that. Don't love that. But we can't. We, I mean, they can't close the season with like a half season of uh, Brett uh, Ribbon. Brett really. Ribbon. <laughs> yeah, you know, but you say that, but there's like four or five teams right now. Where I'm like, they can't possibly just start rest the way. <laughs> like, just go roll this guy out there, right? And I know somebody's somebody is going to have to do it. Colt McCoy can't save everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. The Giants are in that same situation, but it was, oh, it, it, it's, fr- it's frustrating with the with the Rams because they were like it, they were right there and they were super exciting and they were a great story. And I was already feeling like, man, I I I blew it on Matt Stafford. I was not attentive enough to like the the off season good vibes on Matt Stafford, and I re- I was really taking that one as a loss. You brought up the Giants, you know, as we found out this morning, like. Not Brian Dayball does the the double yeah. slap here of, you know, we knew Daniel Jones was probably going to be out for the and poor, poor guy, like tears his ACL, tries to go out the next play and he just like buckles into it. Um, so, yeah, that that's p- one thing. And then the other slap is, yeah, we don't know if Tyrod Taylor is going to play again this year. Yeah. And like Tommy DeVito, man, is just like, that's not that's not an NFL quarterback. So. I would luckily from a fantasy perspective, I mean, this feels like a super crass thing to say, but luckily from a fantasy perspective, nobody really cares about the giants. Right. It, other than, uh, Oh, one guy, Saquon Barkley, right? Like I don't have Barkley on a single team, Andy, but if I did, I would be like beyond coping corner. I would be like yeah. staring off into the abyss, like situation with him right now. 
Yeah, you're like it's been bad enough, and he missed enough time that that you you'd already learned to you know uh, uh, either survive or sink without Saquon Barkley, right? So like you're 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 probably dead in the water if, if he was your first round, second round pick. Maybe not. Like that is actually grat. It's like a gratifying thing in the fantasy season. I don't know. Like I have a couple teams that drafted Nick Chubb in the first round, and I'm like I'm I'm pretty good, and um, I'm finding those seasons to be very satisfying. So I hope that you've been able to navigate the the Saquon Barkley situation, which is nearly as bad. Um, but that's pretty yeah, that's that's pretty rough right now. Anybody who was like, but but you're right. Other than other than Barkley you could you could have been hoping for a big season from Darren Waller but that's a relatively replaceable position and come on you weren't like putting all of your chips on Darren Waller like carrying you to a fantasy win Ooh, you might have been feeling that way about about Barkley well like like I get the I don't know I, I understood the reasons to hype him um but there were obviously you know long-standing reasons to be skeptical of that and whatever it hasn't worked out but he was not you know, it wasn't like a second round tight right. end, third sure. round tight end, anything like that. The Barkley, the Barkley thing is going to hurt a little bit. And it's obviously, it goes without saying that it's never good for a running back when the quarterback situation is an absolute flaming disaster. Hey, just because you mentioned this player in passing, um, and usually Thursday night players don't make their way into the panic meter uh, unless it's really, really, really bad. But you mentioned the name George Pickens um, at some point when you're talking about Cooper Cup. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I guess I want to ask you like level of concern on Pickens when he has like, like our uh, Brett Coleman and EJ Snyder from the bootleg of uh, podcast. They do a great job. Those guys are awesome. They have a great YouTube uh, channel, the whole thing. Like ch- definitely check those guys out. They were offering a, um, a partnership or like a boost or something with um, underdog fantasy for one of their pick'em games. And it was just like George Pickens just had to get over 0.5 <laughs> yards. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, that's horrible. What a beautiful thing to have happen. I think Underdog and those guys all actually just like refunded all the tickets, which is great. That's amazing. Probably the right thing to do to be on on the right side of history. But I I guess I wanted to ask you about like level of concern on Pickens because he had freaking negative one um, yards or whatever. Freaking negative yardage. And two, Andy, like the NFL is a very unpredictable league. Very strange things happen all the time, right? All kinds of chaos. But if you were going to tell me that like one player is going to, after his team wins, complain about his usage, (laughs) do the delete the Instagram (laughs) stuff, I would have said, oh, yeah, that's George Pickens. Easily George Pickens. And that's apparently exactly what happened after Thursday. I mean, come on, bro. But anyways, level of concern on Pickens. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's not nothing. I, I mean, I feel like almost the best case scenario right now with Deontay there and the the limitations of the offense, generally limitations of the quarterback, we're probably right back where we were last year, where if George Pickens is going to do anything in the box score, it's going to be a hero play. It's going to be a touchdown. Like, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't think his bad weeks are going to look like, you know, like Deontay's bad weeks are still going to be like five catches for 45 yeah. yards, something like that, which I feel, you know, that's, that's great. That's a that's a pretty decent floor. Um, it, it ain't like that with Pickens. It's no points with, <laughs> with George Pickens, right? It's like, it's like three targets and no catches. Um, and then obviously this, this past week was as painful as it gets to, to miss a touchdown by like six inches. Cause you, cause you don't get both feet in bounds when you could have got both oh, feet in yeah, bounds. And, that, and um, that is all on you, man. Like that is totally 100. On you. you can't delete that off of Instagram. That is 100% <laughs> on you. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I, I, I never know what to do with these, like the kids who, uh, you know, st- stop following people and they take logos off their off their Instagrams and they delete photos and stuff like that. I don't know. Like the, maybe that's just it's just a bad moment, right? It's a bad moment that is super visible to a whole lot of people. And you you felt a certain way for like a minute and a half and got over it. But then it's too late because you've done a semi permanent thing. Um, so hopefully it's not deeper than that. But it does have. It does have some pretty strong, I mean, it's hard not to make the comparison because of the team and the, you know, the, the, I don't know, the, the expectations that we might have had for the players, but man, it's like the strongest possible Chase Claypool vibes. I mean, we just saw this happen with Elijah Moore last year, right? (laughs) Where he literally went on a complaining fest while his team was winning about not getting targets. Um, and, And you know what? 
at least I wasn't on this one, right? Like I was on the IU thing the year before <laughs> and then Elijah Moore the year after that. At least I wasn't really like, I mean, I like George Pickens, but you know, wasn't quite into him in this regard. And you know, producer Colin brings up a great point in the chat. This is actually all on you, the media. Okay. And I'm saying this as a podcast, but it's on you, the media, right? Like Al Michaels and Kirk Herbstreet talking about like, Deontay Johnson, like he's just some third stringer that like is getting all these targets because George yeah. Pickens is being triple teamed. Like, get out of here. Everybody is overrated George Pickens at the point that he thinks he's better than he is. And now he's unfollowing all his teammates on Instagram. What a disaster of a situation. Uh, speaking of disasters, Andy, let's talk about the Seahawks because we got a lot of Seahawks <laughs> submissions this week. <laughs> at Anthony Russo 97 says, uh, player I'm panicking on has to be DK Metcalf. He might be getting weeded out by JSN's emergence and Tyler Lockett's chemistry with Geno. But, oh, by the way, people are panicked about Tyler Lockett, too. <laughs> at Turf OSU says, I'm getting a little worried about Tyler Lockett, bro. Uh, at EZ1889 says, Geno has regressed, and it seems like other options are very viable beyond DK Metcalf. Ball is spread out too much. Tough defense, but doesn't get any easier. And we got way too many, I mean, Kenneth Walker's admissions to even count. So, Andy, state of the state with the Seattle Seahawks. I absolutely love that some people are panicking about DK Metcalf because of Lockett and other people are panicking about Lockett because of DK Metcalf. That's fantastic. Beautiful um, stuff. This is like, uh, like this is going to happen when a team just gets absolutely, absolutely stomped into the dust. Right. <laughs> right. Like that's, that's what happened. Nobody covered in glory after week nine for the Seahawks. Absolutely. No one, the team gained barely 150 total yards, right? There was just, there was, there was nothing to go around. Um, I will remind people, I will remind the, the Metcalf manager, you know, he's like a week removed from having 14 targets. So that's fine. Um, Lockett himself, a week removed from like 81 yards and a touchdown, eight catches. He's, he's topped 80 receiving yards, like two times in his last four games. We, we knew, I mean, you know, the position, like there, there's going to be the occasional quiet week. It's fine. The, the ceiling clearly has not been as high for the offense and Gino is not having like a, an absolutely heroic season like he did last year, but I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm worried about those two. Like, you know, if I'm legitimately worried about someone, it, it, it's usually because not just role, not just ceiling for the offense, but like, man, are we talking about declining skills? And I don't think mm -hmm. that's really going on here. I, I think a little bit of this is, is you know, G Gino coming off a career year, not matching his career year, perhaps. The, I will say the guy that I would legitimately be worried about um, is Kenneth Walker. Um, right. And, and he was... Maybe maybe there's a little found money there earlier in the season, and maybe he was never going to be that guy. And you certainly didn't draft him like you probably didn't draft him round two, or anything like that. So he's not a he's not a too big to fail, you know, fantasy commodity necessarily. But the, just usage wise, this this could be a real problem because he's played. Um, less than 50% of the snaps in two straight weeks. Zach Charbonnet has outsnapped him. Hasn't really output, like nobody did anything this past week. Um, and it's not like Charbonnet is, is just lighting up box scores or anything like that, but he's, he's seeing the field a little bit more. And he has like the third down roll kind of locked down. And he seems to have like, if we're going to get in hurry up, we're going to get in two minute offense. That seems like it's Charbonnet. And, and this is just, you know, that's a, that's a lot of opportunity taken away from Kenneth Walker, who was very regularly playing like two thirds of the snaps for like the first six weeks of the season. So I think there is a, a you know, he's going to, it's not like he can't help you, um, but I think he's going to yeah. be more TD dependent and he's going to be heavily, you know, game flow dependent. And that is a, that is a really tricky thing to, to forecast in advance. We try and we often fail. So that's going to get a little messy. Walker is the one that I am that I am really worried about because I think opportunities are legitimately getting taken away from him. Yes, panic is not really the word I'd use because like if you have Kenneth Walker on your fantasy team, I think your fantasy team is probably pretty good. Um like I think you you've had a real nice run and Kenneth Walker has probably already outkicked his average draft position. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of the inverse of the Tony Pollard thing where if you have Tony Pollard your team probably stinks. Even if the rest of the season is going to go pretty well, it might be a little too late to help you out. Whereas like, all right, now Kenneth Walker has gotten you to this point. You need to start adjusting expectations. And like Kenneth Walker is not a set it and forget it. RB one every single week. He's probably somebody you're playing every week and you're just going to have to live with that variance, but you need to adjust those expectations. So panic isn't the word I'd use, but I'm with you that like adjusting expectations is the case there. 
panic is probably not the word I'm using for DK Metcalf either, but I am understanding why other people are panicked about it because what just didn't make sense to me this off season was why DK Metcalf went so much higher than Tyler Lockett and Lockett hasn't been great or anything. Yeah. Nobody really has hit in this passing game so far. Cause Gino hasn't had like that kind of moment, but like similar to what we said with Tony Potter, like talk to me this week after week 10, when they face the freaking Washington commanders <laughs> who are terrible on defense. If Gino can't get it done there, I'm full. We'll, let's talk one week from today. Cause then I'm probably panicking. I'm not going to panic after a team plays the Baltimore Ravens. Like, we need to wrap yeah. our minds around the fact that the Baltimore Ravens defense is not just good. It's historically good. Uh, ben Solak from The Ringer had this note. The 2023 Baltimore Ravens defense is allowing a touchdown on only 8.7% of opposing drives. Since 2000, that's as far back as a true media, the data source he's using, it's as far back as it goes. Only one defense has been better. Oh, by the way, that's the 2000 Ravens. Like the 2000 <laughs> Ravens widely regarded as like one of the Pretty best defenses ever. Pretty good team. The, 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 these Ravens don't have a Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, like one of those guys. But Mike McDonald is awesome. They're so good as a collective unit. So like if your fantasy players get stuffed in a locker against the Ravens, we're not panicking after that. We are going to panic if the Seahawks don't crush the Commanders. At the very least, they don't throw all over the Commanders. I'm going to allow some panic then. Yeah, you know what I would like to see from that game is is like I I just want to see two receivers have a like have yes. a big game simultaneously, right? Like that's I guess that's my ongoing worry for the for the Seahawks is like both of these guys by the end of the year we could look at the numbers and be like, eh, it's fine. Metcalf finished with 900 yards and whatever, seven touch of fine. Um, but like. We, we need them to both be able to do it at like simultaneously some of the time, right? It can't just be an offense where like, okay, well, only one guy gets to go off each week. Who's it going to be? Right. And especially because they have a first round rookie receiver in the mix too. Like, and, and yeah. that is looking pretty rough in terms of trying to split the pie that way. If Gino is going to even be slightly, slightly worse than what he was last year, it's going to be tough for all these guys to hit on a, on a weekly basis. So, all right, let's move on. Speaking of the Ravens, and I know Andy's got thoughts about this, but I'm not going to let him be mean to you at Ralph football. <laughs> I'm not going to let Andy bully you about this because I know he's got thoughts about this. He already said it earlier today. Um, Ralph football sends in this might sound ridiculous, but I'm panicked about Lamar Jackson. I think he's one of the best real quarterbacks in the NFL but it has been ages since he's been a clear, consistent difference maker in the fantasy realm. Harbaugh, their defense, and the red zone run game lower his ceiling. Andy, thoughts? Well, I'm not going to... Okay, there there are some people who have filed complaints about Lamar Jackson um, that I find a little bit irritating. I, I recognize that Ralph F Football has added some important caveats here, right? Like, he, Lamar is playing very well. Um, I just... I. I get frustrated at the people who are just like, man, Trevor Lawrence is trash. Lamar Jackson is trash. He's killing me, right? Like those are the those are the complaints that that really get to me because they're they're playing very well. Their teams are winning. Lamar like, like Lamar is legitimately playing great football. He's he's completing over seventy one percent of his throws, right? He's also he's also on pace to. Um, I was looking at the numbers uh, last night. Like he's on pace for close to five hundred pass attempts. It's like four hundred and eighty pass attempts. He's He's never been in the vicinity of that before. It's not like we're, we're not headed toward necessarily his best passing season, but in terms of volume, it's there. Like I, you know, his, again, his team just absolutely demolished the Seahawks. And, you know, if, if you don't get your, your passing uh, scores or your fantasy points early in a game like that, it's just probably not going to go that well. Like mm -hmm. Tyler Huntley finished up for the Ravens because they absolutely destroyed the Seahawks. Um, it's going to happen sometimes, but Lamar is Lamar is like a couple weeks removed, three weeks removed, right from like four combined touchdowns. The the big games are still going to be there, and I think the other good thing at quarterback is that nobody's running away with this position. Like we may get to the end of the year, and it's it's probably going to be Jalen Hurts, right? Because every one yard touchdown belongs to Jalen Hurts in Philly. But even Hurts isn't like you know, he, he, there's not, this isn't one of those like Travis Kelsey things where they're, you, you know, you can't believe the distance between the, the front runner at the position and everybody else. Nobody's really separated. So, you know, you can feel fine about having drafted like Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts, Patrick Mahomes, because they're, you know, the one, two, three in some order, but they're not, 
they're not doing the thing that you hoped they would do when you took them <laughs> in round two, right? They're not like, they're not just breaking the game. Um, so I, I could actually make a, make an argument that I'd be a little bit more irritated with myself for, for taking like Mahomes than Lamar Jackson, because at least Lamar was going like fifth, sixth off the board, fourth, fifth, sixth off the board. He wasn't, he wasn't in that group of three that definitely went second or third round. Um, so probably got a better price on Lamar. His big games have been great. Nobody has really distinguished themselves fantasy wise as an absolute lottery ticket. And again, like Lamar is playing at an MVP level. I don't know who the MVP is right now. It's probably AJ Brown. It's probably Tyree Kill. Maybe it should be. Um, but he's in that conversation. He's playing great. I'd, I'd feel OK about that. Yeah, he is kind of right there with Pat Mahomes and CJ Stroud <laughs> and Kirk Cousins yeah. in terms of points per game at the position. So those guys are all four to seven in terms of points per game at the position. So he's been fine. He hasn't been like transformative. He does have a weird fumble. I mean, he's fumbled 10 times this season. He's a weird yeah, fumbling yeah. problem where that's just like dinging you every now and again with the fumbles. But um, overall, I think he's played great. I do think that with their defense being this good, they're not going to have to like shoot out with many teams and they can just sit on their run game. We'll talk about one of their running backs in the waiver wire pickup section. Um, I think that the season where like Lamar puts up bonkers video games numbers, it's similar with Mahomes right now too, where like the defense doesn't necessitate those situations. So uh, yeah, yeah, panic on Lamar. Yeah. I, I don't think you need to panic on Lamar, but again, similar sort of situation where like, that's why we talk about range of outcomes with players. And I do think if the defense wasn't historically good, he probably has a season in his range of outcomes where he throws for like 5,000 yards and pushes a thousand rushing yards. They just don't really need him to do that right now. I'll, I'll tell you the other thing with Lamar is that if you think back to your draft, um, Justin Fields probably went right next to him, right? Like they, they went so close to each other in so many leagues. And that, that choice is going to be like one of the defining choices in fantasy football. Cause like Justin could come back, you know, may, maybe he comes back in week 10 and he's good down the stretch, something like that. But you're, I mean, you've already had to move on and you've probably already dropped him, right? Like that was just, you know, that it was an absolutely critical decision at that point in the draft. And like, if you ended up with Lamar, you, you chose wisely. Um, so I'd still be feeling pretty good about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling more than fine uh, about that. Um, at four verts, our colleague Charles McDonald said, <laughs> why is Gabe Davis? I mean, Gabe Davis is Gabe Davis. I don't know what to tell you about that one, buddy. Yeah, people were people were briefly talking themselves and it was kind of fun. I don't know, like a week ago, Gabe Davis, all of a sudden the A dot came down and we're like, oh, oh yeah, we're, we're going to get new usage for gas. Suddenly, Gabe Davis is a, d a fundamentally different player. Now he's just he's Gabe Davis. <laughs> he's, he's Gabe Davis again. Yeah, that was one of the worst fantasy narratives of all time. Gabe Davis is going to be a totally different player because his A dot changed one week. OK, uh, last couple ones here sticking on the theme of good players on good teams should we panic about them at FFL underscore consultant said Devonte Smith target shares dwindling. He's touchdown or bust at the moment. And at I don't on makeup act up. I don't, I mean, I don't even know what's going on there with that one. Uh, Deandre Swift <laughs> has no touchdown equity and doesn't catch enough passes to make up for it. Well, I'll tell you what, both of these guys got a little bit of passing volume opened up with Dallas Goddard breaking his damn arm or whatever. Yeah. And he's gonna, probably going to be on IR. So I think Devontae Smith is actually, if you have people out there that feel this way, I'd use these last few moments to potentially try to trade for him because I actually think he's going to finish the season really strongly. Yeah, that's kind of the it's kind of the telling thing and one of the informative things about about doing you know this podcast and and soliciting uh, some of these uh, you know hey who are you freaking out about uh, like we're I know I know who the buy lows are right <laughs> I feel like feel like Devontae Smith is a pretty is a pretty clear buy low because I. He, He's obviously no no threat to AJ Brown at this point on a week to week basis. Brown is playing unbelievable football, having one of those years. Like if if anybody this season really has a, a you know, it's like him and Tyree Kill who who currently have a shot to have just the historic season that twenty years from now we're thinking about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and obviously Devonte Smith is 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 very much second fiddle. Um, I get it. I get I get the frustration with that. You were hoping maybe it was it was going to be like a you know. A, a, a co number ones thing, whatever. It's not going to be that way, but man, is he set up well, uh, in the, in the back half of the season and it's still a great offense, right? So 
I mean, Philadelphia can put 27, 30 on anybody. That's, that's still where we want our key fantasy pieces. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be too panicky about this. And the fact that we keep here, even now, even this week when like Devante hasn't been a problem in the last couple of weeks, right. To, to still see his name in this segment, um, tells you that there's still a, a buying opportunity out there. I will also say with Swift, um, I feel like maybe we just got we maybe maybe not you and I some people um, uh, perhaps the Minnesota game had folks thinking that yeah. Swift was someone maybe other than who he's who he is who he's always been um, like good player in a great situation and that should probably be enough for you um, I don't I don't think that you took DeAndre Swift in like round two and expected like immediate oh, no. smash you know he was like a seventh season. eighth round pick you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and he got a lot of negative, like late, you know, buzz because uh, there was a real reporting about Kenny and Kenny Gainwell did open the season, you know, as the as the featured runner there. Um, Swift so had Ah like, Carey in week one. Ah Carey, yeah. one more than you, Andy. Yeah, seriously. Um, so I, I I don't know. Like I feel has mostly been a win with uh, with Swift. You're you're right to say that. I mean the. The problem with him from a touchdown perspective is that literally any time they're right. within like a yard and a half of the goal line, that is definitely going to be Jalen Hurts. Um, that's over. That's that's absolutely done. So it's a worry, but you still, I don't know, didn't you just get 20 touches from an Eagles running back? <laughs> like that's, I don't know, that's pretty good. That's going to that's gonna go well for you many weeks. Yeah, they, there was the one uh, little counter off the uh, off the push yeah. push play and they gave DeAndre Swift the rushing touchdown just a week ago. Um, so He doesn't have no touchdown equity. He does have an alarmingly small amount of touchdown equity, giving that he like the crazy thing about DeAndre Swift is, yeah, I thought there was no scenario where his carry log was going to go like 18, 16, 15, 10, 17, 14, 16, 28. Like that's going in reverse all the way back to that week one, one carry. I thought there was no chance he was going to get that type of carry volume. He has gotten it. It hasn't always been super hyper efficient. And yes, the lack of touchdowns is pretty frustrating. But yeah, I, I think Swift is a guy that like, if if you saw those first couple games and you suddenly talk to yourself and you're like, oh yeah, I've got myself like a running back one and I stole him in the seventh to eighth round. Yeah. You probably did steal him in the seventh to eighth round, but you probably got yourself like a really good running back two that's gonna finish somewhere between like, I don't know, 13, 14, 15 and end of your fantasy rankings. Yeah, yeah. That feels that that absolutely feels right. And that, you know, I I remember the the victory lap, whatever. This is why you got to take victory laps in fantasy, like at the exact moment that a guy first goes off. Like kudos to everybody who victory lapped DeAndre Swift after the Minnesota game because it's, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been like that ever since necessarily. And we might not get another one of those this season. But again, you're tied to a great offense. It's a it's an incredible offensive line. Um, he's been he's been a phenomenal like yards before contact player his entire career. So He's, st- he's still the setup is the setup is great. And I agree with you. Like the carry volume has been better than I expected it to be. The other option is to not take victory laps. That is still um, that is available to you. If you if you if you want to go that route, if you want to go that route. I mean, it's, it's fun sometimes just like realize that it's a it's an interesting game. This whole football thing. All right. On that note, let's talk waiver wire pickups. Andy, who should the people be adding the top five waiver wire pickups heading into week 10? All right. My caveat here is that I wanted to include a tight end and a quarterback. It is just this is such a nightmare by week, right? It's only four teams, but those teams happen to include the Chiefs, the Dolphins, the Eagles, right? So like some of the some of the most important players in fantasy are off this week. So I wanted to get I wanted to get every position in here. So I want to start with tight end. Uh, and my number five is going to be Kate Otten. Um I, and maybe maybe I'm partial to him because I actually like spot started him uh, in, as a fill in for Laporta, and he had the biggest humble week brag. of his career. A little, little bit of a humble brag, but it was just it was a spin the wheel situation at tight end, right? Because there's a whole bunch of guys who were like at the bottom of the draft board, and you picked one, and so many of them went off in week nine. It was super convenient. Um, so Otten. Six catches, 70 yards, two touchdowns against Houston in like a glorious game. People should go back and watch that game. It was fantastic. Really, really fun. Um, the, the key with Otten, I think, is that it wasn't just, it's not like this is a total one-off. I mean, of course, he's not going to have other multiple touchdown games, but he's seen 21 targets over his last three. Like he's been a real part of that offense. The other thing that I like about Otten, he is, um, 
he is as close to never coming off the field as any skill player in the game. He's played over 90% of the snaps absolutely every week. So he's always out there. He's clearly a bit of a circle, you know, sketchy quarterback, but he's a bit of a circle of trust, trust player for Baker Mayfield seeing a lot of volume lately. So I don't think, I don't think we've seen the last fantasy relevant game from Otten. I don't think this is just one of those like one-off explosions. He only got two targets, but they both ended in touchdowns. That's not what this is. This is a this is a real player in Tampa Bay's offense. So Otten is my number five. My number four, I wanted to throw a quarterback in here. And it's a, you know, it's a bit, bit of a sketchy week for quarterbacks. But I I want to just remind people that Russell Wilson, widely available, about 55% oh available in Yahoo leagues right now. I'm not I'm not endorsing Russell Wilson as like a secretly great player or anything like that. I will just say that this is not exactly the Russell Wilson of last year. He's got 16 touchdown passes in eight games. The yardage isn't always there, but 16 TD passes in eight games in this season, um, that's pretty good. He's also on pace to rush for over 400 yards, which he has not done since 2020. And I thought he was headed entirely the wrong direction in terms of, of being a rushing threat. So there's a little bit of fantasy juice here. Again, the guy's on pace to throw 30 touchdown passes. He's widely available. If you need a fill in, he's fine. Um, my number three, a guy that we've talked about before, Keaton Mitchell, um, finally like really popped. And, and this, um, this was a long time coming and promises were made much earlier in the season uh, and didn't come to fruition. And then all of a sudden we get nine carries, 138 and a touchdown, a couple of really big runs that accounted for most of that yardage. And maybe, like just maybe, he's working his way into a, into a decent share of a three-man committee. I think there's no chance that either Gus Edwards or Justice Hill goes away. I think they've both played very well. I think, I think Gus is an absolute circle of trust player for Baltimore. But I think Keaton Mitchell has worked his way in here. I also think that this is not a case where he is going to leapfrog two guys and suddenly get 20 touches a game. He's really small. He's like, he's like 5'8", 190, something like that. Um, but hugely productive collegiate player. He's got four, three speed. That speed translates to the field. Like we see that, um, we saw it in the preseason. We just saw it in week nine. I think Keaton Mitchell is going to be a real thing going forward, but the kind of guy that you have to flex and not expect to like absolutely carry your backfield. Um, my number two, Zach Charbonnet. We talked a little bit about earlier in the pod about, about Kenneth Walker's diminishing role and diminishing usage. Well, that is coming at the expense of Charbonnet. Um, he, he's outsnapped Walker now in back-to-back games. He's got the third down role, seems to have sort of the hurry-up role. It hasn't translated into anything, really, in the last couple of games. He has 77 scrimmage yards over his last two. So I don't think there's going to be some frenzy bidding war for, for Charbonnet wherever he's available. Um, but I think there is probably a big game coming. Uh, as, as we discussed, they've got Washington coming up, and that's a, that's a super friendly defense no matter what you want to do. So great spot ahead for him. Really versatile player. I think Charbonnet needs to get a look. And then my number one... I, I get why Tank Dell is eligible for this conversation. I understand why he was dropped um, because he had a had a concussion a few weeks ago and then he went into his bye and so you couldn't use him for a couple weeks. So fine, whatever. You kicked him to the curb. Um, he had a he had a monster game. He was part of that super fun Houston uh, Bucks game that we saw this weekend. Uh, two touchdowns, 114 yards, 11 targets. Man, the first touchdown was just beautiful throw, beautiful route. Um, beautiful play design. Like it, that, that was a wonderful game to watch. And I would encourage everyone to go back and do it. Um, Dell is so good. And, and this is, this isn't again, as with Otten, this isn't like the first time he's popped a little bit. I mean, he, we saw triple digit yardage back in September. He's been on the field all the time. Um, basically from the, from the moment the season began. So I, I don't, I don't think this is Dell's last big game at all. I don't even think it's necessarily his last two touchdown game. Um, I think he's going to be a real fantasy factor moving forward. And again, as we speak, he's available in 52% of Yahoo leagues. A couple follow-ups on Dell and Mitchell. One, uh, I saw JJ Zacharyson note this, that Tank Dell hit a season high 28.9% target share last week. He's now scored fewer than nine PPR points in four games this year and more than 20 PPR points in three (laughs) games, literally nothing in between, which, I do think fits with his skill set and how he is used. I mean, when he hits, he's going to hit big. I do think there will be some volatility there, which is totally fine. Like, we're talking about a, a freaking receiver you pick up off waivers, whether you picked him yeah. up at the beginning of the year or now, like, he's going to give you some up and downs. Totally fine. You want guys tethered to CJ Stroud, who, like, is a total stud. Um, Nico Collins is good. Tank Dell is good. Like, all these guys are really, nobody even really wants to, like, cape up for Dalton Schultz, but. 
in this offense, Dalton Schultz is really good. Yeah. Um, he's yeah. rostered in 69% of leagues, but the rest of the leagues, like, wake up. I think he could be a top 12 tight end rest of the season for whatever that's worth. And on Keaton Mitchell, um, I was watching the, the film for Zay Flowers from this past week and um, do interception, perception, all that. And I, I will tell you what, Andy, like on his touchdown run, yeah, yeah, the, the touchdown run, the long touchdown run, it was kind of Devin Achan esque, right? Where yeah. like it's very similar to that run that he had against the Giants that everybody lost their minds on when he just absolutely looked like he was shot out of a cannon and beat every single angle from the Seahawks. Not like old, slow, unathletic defense. I know Bobby Wagner is back there, but their secondary is like young and fast and explosive. And Keaton Mitchell outran all of those guys. I mean, it's not totally dissimilar to a Chan. I don't know that it'll be quite as insane, but um, in terms of like the, the big plays and the big fantasy lines and stuff like that, but it's pretty similar to like, I agree with you, Gus Edwards, especially probably not going to lose his role. I think they could phase out Justice Hill a little bit, not completely, but he's still going to hang around the fringes. This run game is going to be important, just like the Dolphins run game is going to be important. And like, why can't Keaton Mitchell be the poor man's Devin Achan? Yeah, it's it's definitely the right comp because they're they're similarly sized players, right? Um, Mitchell Mitchell was uh, like you know like Achan saw a huge uh, a huge workload at the collegiate level, um, average like seven yards per carry. He's like they're both they're both crazy fast. Achan is like um, NCAA national qualifier fast, right? Like there's Achan is like four two fast versus four three, which is uh, you know doesn't sound like a lot, but it like in on the field it's it's crazy, um, it's crazy speed. So Achan a little bit faster, a little bit a little bit better in terms of every trait that we kind of like, but but Keaton Mitchell is just like one tick behind. Um, and the most impressive thing is that the speed again it it is just absolutely translated immediately. You saw it like you saw it in the preseason. In the preseason he was just moving at a very different rate of speed from anybody else on the field. Yeah, uh, so to really put a bow on this, um, as producer Colin noted, uh, according to Next Gen Stats on that touchdown run, Keaton Mitchell had a 20.99 miles per hour top speed. It's the fastest play by a Ravens ball carrier this season. Uh, well, that's kind of light work for our guy, uh, Devon Achan, who has the third, the second and the yeah. third fastest speeds <laughs> so far this year at 21.9 miles per hour and 21.76 miles per hour. He's also got one in there, um, the 10th fastest speed on a three yard run, 21.5 miles per hour. So maybe we're dealing with a slightly like a, a diet coke version of uh, that's of actually Devin. wild that somebody did it on a three yard run and obviously somebody get a little head of speed going ahead uh, of steam going on a three yard run but that's crazy because these plays are uh, anytime anybody reaches 21 miles an hour in the nfl it's like a it's like a 40 yard run right like you have to be uh, at a dead actually, sprint okay, I, it, I take it back actually it's like there was a, maybe like a weird error on their website it's actually was a nullified touchdown penalty or, or something like that I don't, okay I don't know. I okay mean, this is making me that, excited for javon achan again <laughs> tell you that. i am that list is that list is so fun. I was just looking at it like last week because um, because Rashid Shahid had actually made his way on there. It's just all dolphins at the top. It is hilarious. It is Mostert at its H at it, its Tyree kill and they just dominate the 21 mile an hour runs. Yep. Dolphin, 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 dolphin. Yeah, that's like freaking nine of the top 20, which is pretty yeah. insane. Uh, too bad none of it ever happens against good teams so that's a shame for the Miami <laughs> Dolphins but on that note <laughs> that is going to do it for uh, today's show Andy shout out to you appreciate it hell of a hell of a show as always and I'm glad you weren't mean to anybody about their panic this week that was very <laughs> kind of you thank you I'm, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to be better all right it's going to do it for us like I said on Wednesday Austin Eckler he's back with us plays on Monday Night Football can't wait to see um, and check in with Austin after whatever happens on Monday Night Football, because I don't know, as I'm saying these words right now, because that game has not happened yet. Either way, should be a fun show tomorrow. Until then, we're out.